Well, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, today we wanted to talk um, a little bit uh, with more detail and specificity uh, about the issue of schools, and the reopening of our schools. I come at this uh, not academically, not as governor, but as a parent of four young children, uh, different ages, different cohorts, different situations, one respect, different schools. Uh, we're having conversations that I know millions of Americans, millions of Californians in particular, are having. These conversations are trying. These conversations can at times be confusing. Uh, this is a challenging moment uh, for all of us, particularly parents and particularly those uh, that are responsible for over six million uh, of our kids in our public education system. So I want to talk about where we are, what our progress to date looks like, lessons we learned uh, from the spring session, uh, recognition uh, that good enough never is, that everything we're putting out here today we recognize uh, requires even more work, uh, more focus, more energy, uh, and more effort. And so I want to just begin with that as a preamble of deep recognition of the anxiety, deep recognition uh, of the role that we all play on making this school year modified as it will be as successful as we possibly can. Uh, and I also am very mindful that every single child is unique, every single child is special, every single child uh, has a unique expression. And that means that no two of us learn the same. Uh, and as a consequence, uh, this conversation we'll have here today, a conversation where we're going to invite in a, a number of educational leaders uh, to participate in this conversation, means something differently for each and every person watching. And I'm very, very cognizant of that. Uh, and I recognize uh, that our role, our responsibility, is to do everything we can to tailor and individualize to the unique needs of families and individuals that we're here to serve. But let me begin with uh, a predicate, not just a preamble, and that is safety is the foundational uh, first approach that we look at the lens to which we advance all of our decision making. Safety for our students and safety for those responsible for educating and supporting our students. Clearly our teachers, but also we cannot forget our bus drivers. We can't forget our janitors. We can't forget all of the incredible support staff uh, that we also are entrusted to support and protect to keep healthy. One of the things we did uh, a couple of months back uh, and in recognition that we needed to have time to prepare uh, in terms of focusing on preparing the physical environment because, again, our commitment, our default, long term, is in-person instruction. The social-emotional benefits of in-person instruction are self-evident. The need to develop relationships, develop connections, to be inspired by a teacher or a magical moment that changes the trajectory of one's life. It is suboptimal to have that experience virtually. That is something I believe overwhelmingly is uh, accepted and recognized. So we are in a suboptimal environment, but with expectation and anticipation that we will go back to the environment that we are more familiar with. Uh, we wanted to make sure that our schools had the chance to be uh, prepared in that respect to have the procurement of PPE, face shields, face covers, uh, thermometers, hand sanitizers, and the like. And I just want to remind you uh, that the state itself, in anticipation of reopening our schools to in-person instruction, has provided already uh, millions and millions of masks and face shield, tens of thousands of thermometers, and million and a half gallons of hand sanitizer. I recognize that's not enough, and I'll talk in a moment of what we were successfully able to do with the budget to provide an unprecedented amount of resources to supplement what the state has already provided. But this is important uh, because I want folks to know the state's commitment to provide at no cost to the districts uh, these supplies in anticipation of uh, being able to move in the direction all of us want to move. That said, we're anticipating, based upon the current analysis, uh, and we'll be coming out Monday with more detailed uh, information as it relates to county 
by county watch list, which is foundational. We'll talk more about that in a few moments as well. But we estimate at this moment at least over 90 percent of our students, and you can argue it's uh, closer to 95, 97 percent uh, of our students are likely to start the school year with distance learning. And that's what we're preparing for. That's what we're disproportionately focused on. Uh, that school year has already begun uh, for many. Yesterday, today, next week, large cohort a week after. Uh, so school year is upon us, and we are now just beginning this journey together uh, on a more robust approach to distance learning in this state. We made this point. Uh, that schools may be closed, I've made this point in the past, but class is still in session, that we are committed, we are accountable to continuing to ensure that not only we're preparing our teachers to be great teachers in a very constrained and difficult environment, preparing our students to be at their best, uh, but that we are preparing uh, a broad strategy, recognize that we still have a lot of gaps and a lot of inequities that need to be addressed. And so we will get to some of the details of what we're planning to do in that space in a moment. But I want you to know uh, that is top of mind and we're very cognizant of our responsibility in those challenges. Accordingly, we've been guided over the course of the last many months by a lot of outreach. Uh, I want to thank, and he'll be on phone in a moment, uh, our Superintendent of Public Education, the work CDE, California Department of Education, has done in terms of their outreach, formal, informal, uh, surveys that they've put out, surveys that the state has put out, other organizations, nonprofits, NGOs have put out, uh, really trying to get a sense of where school districts are, where parents are, uh, and where our workforce believes we need to go as it relates to supporting our efforts on distance learning. You'll just see three uh, specific surveys on this slide uh, that represent different times uh, and different questions uh, related uh, to our preparedness. You'll see that first uh, comment, or rather first stat, 96.1% of school districts that reported uh, they were at least starting to provide technology for students for distance learning. This was at the end. This specifically was a survey from May 15th to the end of the school year uh, where we were all rushing uh, to provide for distance learning, but you can see the vast majority, overwhelming majority of districts, we're moving in that direction, and we want to carry that momentum and all of the challenges related to the closing of that school year and spring session, the lessons learned, want to carry some of that momentum uh, into the fall session. 91% of parents in another survey, this was done in late July, uh, say that they have the technology needed for distance learning. Now, I, I recognize you get under those numbers, uh, what does that mean? One, one laptop for four uh, members of the family, that's not adequate. Download speeds, that may not be top of class. All of those things are self-evident in terms of our concerns, but you get a sense of where parents at least felt they were as it relates to just basic technology needs for distance learning. But when you get to the issue of confidence, when you get to the issue of more nuance, you can see a smaller number of people, districts, uh, students, and families feel that they have ultimately uh, the kind of capacity, uh, understanding, ability uh, to utilize this technology in, in a meaningful and more robust manner. And so we talk in terms of bridging the digital divide. It's not just about Wi-Fi hotspots and not just about what you plug uh, those virtual hotspots into. It's also about something much richer, much deeper. Uh, that said, we put out uh, new requirements. Not every state did this. In fact, I would argue the vast majority, based upon our analysis of states, have not done this, but California did. We put out expectations, guide rails, with real money, and I'll get to the money in a moment, with our expectations for our statewide requirements as it relates to what distance learning would look like. The reason we were able to do that is we had enlightened leadership in the legislature that was committed to that cause. Obviously, the great support the superintendent of public education and Linda Darling Hammond, head of the school board here, you'll hear from in a moment as well. But we were able to have clarity in terms of our conviction uh, that we believe that distance learning was likely to happen based upon community spread of COVID-19 and the background rates. And so we had time to really be deliberative time to work with the legislature on protocols, processes, on budget language to really condition requirements with funding. So it's really about local flexibility at the end of the day, 
but with real accountability in terms of minimum requirements. Those include access to more devices for those that don't have them, more connectivity, quality connectivity, daily interaction. Look, as I said, digital, or rather, distance learning is suboptimal. We just don't want people to take their lectures uh, and just videotape them and then provide them online. By the way, you can just go to YouTube and pretty much get that in every subject matter that's ever been debated uh, since the beginning of mankind. Uh, this has to be a much more interactive process where we want to bring our students into the screen truly engaged, peer to peer, not just with the interaction uh, of a teacher. And so we want a more dynamic engagement uh, to the extent possible uh, through distance learning. We want as much individualized learning, particularly for students of special needs, which is foundational as much as we can. And that's an area of obvious concern, and I'm going to talk about more of that in a moment. We want challenging assignments. We don't want just people to dial this in, and we want to recognize the diversity of the state, children, uh, as well as parents uh, that uh, are uh, not necessarily as proficient in English, so ESL learners, English second language learners, and obviously uh, meeting the needs of those with uh, special uh, challenges. That said, we have provided to date uh, the access to at least devices and hotspots. I, I've talked on multiple occasions in the past. I want to thank uh, Tony Thurman and his digital divide task force that he put together, and Linda darling -Ham. And I want to thank my wife, first partner, uh, Jennifer, uh, for her outstanding work making phone calls. Trust me, I was standing next to her in many of those cases, emails on Sunday morning, uh, trying to get philanthropy and individuals as well as companies uh, to provide devices and Wi-Fi hotspots. I think you've seen those numbers, 73 devices, 33,000 devices. We were able to procure over 100,000 free Wi-Fi hotspots throughout the state of California. We subsequently worked with California Public Utilities Commission, and they've made available an additional 87,000 Wi-Fi hotspots, part of our budget uh, effort, and they set aside uh, tens of millions of dollars in this space to help supplement the support for bridging that divide uh, for our schools. The issue, though, uh, of digital divide can't not be just distilled in uh, simple numbers of devices and Wi-Fi hotspots. We really need to provide an abundance of resource. I don't know, abundance means something to some people. Others say, well, it's a scarcity of resource. But I, I will say I'm proud this state took a lot of the CARES Act funding, uh, a lot of the federal dollars for this pandemic. Many other states use that money for general fund purposes appropriately and understandably. We used a disproportionate amount of that federal stimulus dollars, and we gave it to our education system this year for learning loss, focused on equity, focused on the lens of addressing the lessons we learned in spring in anticipation we may need to bring those lessons in closing that divide into the fall session. $5.3 billion, real discretion, real capacity to procure more PPE, to provide more deep sanitation, to supplement supports, to individualize learning to the extent possible, speech therapy and other supports for uh, those with special needs, and of course to provide more Wi-Fi hotspots, to provide uh, more direct supports, fiber to the extent possible and preferable to provide, obviously, more Chromebooks and the like. 100% of the eligible schools in California have not only been made aware of those resources, 100% have applied for those resources before the first deadline, and they're receiving those funds. I want to encourage you. We uh, have the ability now with our covid19.ca.gov website, I encourage you to go to the covid 19 .ca.gov website, covid19.ca.gov. Uh, go to the site and you can learn to see exactly what your school district, what their allocation was of that $5.3 billion. You can see here on this slide, $450 million went to LI Unified School District, Fresno receiving about $87 million, Elk Grove uh, $44 million. These are just examples of uh, the money being distributed, available, ready with flexibility focused on the issue of learning loss. Again, equity is the word that we are focused on and fully resolved and committed to advancing. Um, 
when you look at the distribution of funds, if you allocate them equally, you're not allocating them equitably. And as a consequence of that, we had a, a very robust debate with the legislature on how we thought best to utilize the CARES Act's funds. 81% uh, of those funds, we landed on that number. We wanted to prioritize for this cohort of individuals, low-income students, students with disabilities, foster youth, homeless students, and those English language learners. I'm very proud of the work we did with the legislature, uh, with the superintendent of public education, Linda Darling Hammonds, outstanding work uh, to guide us in this direction. Uh, and as has been said many times publicly, privately, uh, Brentwood is very different than Inglewood. And as a consequence, the needs are greater in Inglewood. As a consequence of that, we want to provide additional flexibility of resource to address those needs, uh, to do what we can to address these disparities and gaps that predate COVID, but have now been exposed uh, at a different scale since this pandemic. And so that's the framework of focus. Equity lens, robust funding to address learning loss despite other budgetary concerns. Flexibility uh, that is needed uh, for districts. Recognizing localism ultimately uh, is the clarion call as it relates to education in the state. It's enshrined in the state constitution, local control over a thousand school districts in this state. So it truly is bottom up, but bottom up this year with guardrails and real money and real expectations in terms of the supports that we expect to see. Uh, with that, I, I wanna just express my deep gratitude for the support we have received uh, as a state uh, through his leadership. Uh, it has been demonstrable uh, throughout this pandemic Tony Thurman has been uh, not only an advocate in his role as superintendent of public instruction in the state of California, but he's an incredible partner to the state and state agencies. Uh, and his ability to convene people, his ability to work with local districts and do the work that his task force has done, including key legislative leaders, I wanna thank them as well for their support and participation, has helped us not only procure and identify uh, the capacity uh, in terms of philanthropy uh, and more devices and Wi-Fi hotspots, but to do something else. And he can, I hope, talk to this, but he, please, Tony, talk. He's on the phone uh, about uh, more broadly your feelings about where we are and where we're going together. But I, I did want to just acknowledge your work, uh, and I pointed this out. Tony, you may not be able to see this on a slide. Uh, the work you did with Apple, T-Mobile, Office Depot, we put out staples. They all deserve credit, Edison. Uh, that have set aside hundreds of thousands of devices for California schools. It, that may not seem that interesting or even impressive, but there's a global demand for supplies, for Chromebooks, and for equipment, for education. Uh, I don't want to say, I don't want to say it's equivalent to the PPE stress that we all had early on as it relates to supplies, but supplies are constrained and they are not as abundant as they once were. And I just want to thank the superintendent for working with these companies to set aside and prioritize the access of quite literally hundreds of thousands of these devices for our school kids. It's a perfect example of, uh, of something that may not have gotten a lot of attention, but was a lot of work. And, uh, and he led that uh, effort uh, as well as uh, making a point that we're, uh, we followed up on. It's this last point on this bullet. And Tony, I'll turn it over to you right after this. And that is to see if we can leverage our purchasing power uh, outside of just the school districts working with CDE, California Department of Education, but how about the state coming in with all our purchasing power and doing a device state negotiated master contract so we can bring down the cost again, buy at scale, more competitive capacity to get lower costs. That's exactly what we're doing. Thank you, Tony Thurman and Mr. Superintendent, please if you could just add your voice to all of these efforts. Uh, thank you, Mr. Governor. Uh, thank you for your leadership. It's an honor to work with you and the legislature and the State Board of Education on doing the things that we need to do that in my estimation uh, amount to the most difficult circumstances that we will probably encounter in our lifetime. 
Um, you know, it is just that. It is a pandemic of worldwide proportion, and its impacts on California and our nation are just significant. Uh, but I am grateful that we live in a state that is led by a governor and a legislature that have made $5.3 billion available um, to support the needs of distance learning. Let's face it, 97% of our schools or so are in distance learning, at least to start, uh, as a way of being safe until we know if the conditions will change to allow what we know all of our students need in person instruction. But until we get there, we open in distance learning, we, 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 we promote, we, we you know, approach this with safety. It is so important to have had those resources, that $5.3 billion is just incredible. Thank you, uh, Mr. Governor. Thank you to the members of the legislature. Um, uh, you know, like the governor said, we approach this in our work, but we also approach this as parents. And I want to, you know, I'm also a parent of California students. I, I just want to acknowledge first um, how difficult this is right now. And in spite of how difficult it is, everyone is leaning in. I mentioned our governor and legislative partners. I want to acknowledge um, students and parents, uh, teachers, principals and superintendents. Uh, everyone is just leaning in to figure out how to make this happen. You know, one thing that I've noted is that for every piece of guidance that any of us puts out, uh, the pandemic is constantly changing, and we've all had to be constantly changing. You know, the governor does these press conferences on a regular, is always giving new updates. We've tried to provide updates to the field on a regular basis, but our parents and students and educators are constantly adapting. You know, the beginning of school is always a time that's both exciting and filled with anxiety. I would say that that's mounted to a, a higher level now because um, we're, we're, so much has gone into preparation for months. We've all been providing guidance, but the pandemic changes, so then we have to change the guidance. So things are just moving. I just want to acknowledge that. This is a difficult environment to work in, but I want to applaud the resolve and resilience of, of everyone, students, parents, educators, administrators, all leaning in together. Uh, our county superintendents are so important to this process. They convene regular meetings of all of our 1,000 school districts. You know, it has taken just that entire partnership to, to get where we are. And where are we? Schools have opened in some districts, and many are poised to open in just a few days. Uh, in many cases, the resources are there, and in some cases, we're still scrambling to get resources together. But we're all leaning in because we recognize that we can do more together. Uh, on the issue of devices, as the governor points out, is critical. We, we prefer to be in an environment where students have computing devices and connectivity. Uh, we've worked with uh, Apple and T-Mobile um, to uh, connect them directly to districts that are still looking for devices. That for those districts, we want to remind you that you can use your learning loss mitigation funds to purchase those computing devices at a discounted rate. These devices are internet connected and they also can work across all platforms regardless of whatever platform the district uses. Um, as the governor has pointed out, there is a, a, a run on supply worldwide. There just aren't enough computing devices, but Apple and T-Mobile have prioritized devices. Um, Staples and Office Depot have prioritized the devices for our schools. Uh, our team very nicely in our office has really uh, worked with our districts and our school associations to identify where the need is. A number of companies have come forward. I want to acknowledge uh, PG&E, who's uh, making a contribution to support some school districts that are in areas that have been underserved um, and need computing devices. We'll have more information to announce there. Um, we know that there's been a digital divide, but our effort is to provide technology during the pandemic and to use the Digital Divide Task Force to once and for all close the digital divide. We're focused on the short-term needs, but also keeping our eyes on the long-term needs that we know that we have communities in residential and, and rural communities that do not have access uh, to broadband. They don't have the infrastructure. And I know that there are proposals in the legislature um, to do so. As the governor says, we need federal support uh, to support building that infrastructure. Uh, we need resources for our schools. Um, and, and so that's where we all are. We're leaning in. Um, and, and I like to say that we should just focus on the, the three buckets that I think are probably the most important in my estimation. One is safety. Um, I appreciate that the Department of Public Health and the governor have given us a metric for when schools should be closed. Uh, that, that metric is really clear. If you're on the watch list, 
uh, and you haven't been off for 14 days, that's a really clear metric, and I think that's important. I know there's still lots of questions about, you know, how guidance is going to work for any waivers and things of that nature, and I think we're all, as a field, trying to work through those questions. But that's a really clear metric that I like to point to. Safety has to be our first priority. I think as we think about safety, we also have to think about the social, emotional learning needs of our students. And that distance learning mitigation fund that the governor talks about allows schools to get counseling resources. We've been working with school districts to maximize Medi-Cal dollars and, and, you know, I've created a counseling coalition to help address the needs of our students. That's got to be our top priority. You're going to hear us talk a lot in the days and weeks about helping districts improve their family engagement work and providing more professional development for educators on how to do distance learning at a high level. Um, Department of Education is going to be putting out more guidance. We've worked closely with the state board, with CTA, with a number of educator groups, with school districts to get input on what that guidance might look like because we know that live instruction is important. We're not saying that kids need to be on computers all day, but we know that students do better when they see their teachers or their one-to-one -one aides uh, in, in a live, uh, you know, a, a live instruction format um, that's important to their social emotional well-being. We want that to be balanced. We, we know that educators are worried about um, the circumstances that they're headed into and we want to be cautious. Again, safety, social emotional learning, and then we just have to continue to talk about learning. These circumstances are not ideal um, that students are returning to school in, but students continue to learn even under these conditions. And we've got to make that a priority and to make sure that we offset any learning gaps that may have resulted when we first moved into distance learning. We know that there were bumps, but I'm grateful that when we moved into distance learning, people put safety first and there was no playbook to do this. We know that times were bumps. We're learning from that now and we're using that learning to make sure that we guide the next round of distance learning in a way that is balanced, that is thoughtful, and that offsets any learning gaps, that prioritizes equity. And you've heard the governor talk today about resources that districts can use to balance out their distance learning uh, with equity as a lens. Um, these are clearly uncharted, you know, uh, waters. These are times where we don't know all of the answers, but there are some things that we know. Um, the governor says it all the time, wear a face covering. And that'll help to keep us safe and flatten the curve. We can't control what coronavirus does, but we can control how we respond to it. We wear a face covering, we wash our hands, we maintain physical distance, we give ourselves a fighting chance to reduce and prevent um, infection uh, across our communities and certainly in our schools. Uh, we stand committed to work closely with the governor, the Department of Public Health, the State Board of Education, the legislature on continuing to provide guidance to make sure that all of our students are served as well as they can be under these circumstances. Um, again, with a preference and focus on making sure that we do more to improve the delivery of special education, making sure we do more to support English learners, we do more to support those families who are who are loosely connected to schools. You know, we want every school to have a hotline where parents can call if they need help. Don't ask them to email. We want them to have a hotline that they can call. We'll be reaching out to school districts to talk to them about how we create these kinds of family supportive, family engagement models. These are tough times, but as it, re as it relates to providing an education to our students, we've got to rise to that challenge. We can do more together for our six million students I'm grateful for you, Governor. I'm grateful to our state board president and our legislature and to all of our students, parents, educators, administrators, and superintendents. Uh, continue to be safe and well, and we stay tuned and available to answer questions today and at any point for our California education system. Tremendous. Thank you, Mr. Superintendent, and thank you uh, for the spirit uh, uh, that brought you today to, to join us, but more over all the outstanding work you've done. I think what I hope uh, everybody just heard besides all the specifics and the good work the superintendent has been advancing is a spirit of collaboration, a spirit of cooperation uh, that doesn't exist in every state. Many states it does. Uh, but it's a wonderful thing uh, when you have a superintendent and governor and legislative leaders, advocacy uh, of all stripes uh, working uh, with the same goal in mind. And, and the superintendent was very honest and forthright, and none of us are naive of, you know, the challenges that we experienced to, uh, in closing out uh, the school session last year, the challenges uh, that we face uh, with this ever-evolving uh, pandemic, and the challenges of meeting the needs of the largest uh, school system in the United States of America. And so we're open to argument. We're interested in evidence. Uh, we're not ideological about our approach or this endeavor, uh, and we recognize the humility that needs to be uh, behind all of these efforts. 
Uh, some will do as designed and intended. Others will have unintended consequences that we need to own up to and address in real time. But we're condensing decades of conversations uh, in just a few months. And in that spirit and in that light, uh, I want to just pick up a little bit uh, on what uh, the superintendent just said uh, as it relates to the work that we need to do more broadly to support and secure technology and access and address the digital divide for the state of California uh, and for the future of our state to support our parents, to support uh, those teachers that may not need those supports for academic purposes but need them for economic and other purposes. Uh, one of the reasons Tom Steyer uh, agreed to co-chair our Economic and Jobs Recovery Task Force uh, was his desire and his commitment uh, to address the digital divide once and for all. Uh, he made a point which was very resonant with me, um, is we've been talking about the digital divide for the vast majority of our lifetime. Uh, I, we want to move past this uh, and have the digital divide in our rearview mirror. Uh, and while schools are foundational in those efforts, we also need to broaden uh, this uh, agenda. And so with that, I'm very pleased that uh, Tom joined us here today. Uh, he's going to update you on the work of the task force, the work that he's done with internet service providers and others. Uh, and I'll talk in a moment uh, about an executive order we're putting out today based upon his advocacy, based upon his leadership. Tom Steyer. Thank you, Mr. Governor. And I want to take a second at the outset to thank the governor and his team. They are working incredibly hard. They are making tough decisions every day to put the health of Californians first. And as the co-chair of the task force, I am very proud to play a role in helping advise them. We know that across the board, this pandemic, among its many profound impacts, has laid bare the inequalities that are baked into the foundation of our country and all of our systems. One specific example is that too many families, mainly low-income families of color, are without quality internet service. The task force, as the governor said, has been focused from its inception on collaborating to help close this digital divide. Our discussions have ranged over how it's affecting every aspect of our economic and social well-being, from telehealth to teletraining to e-commerce, but particularly the issue of distance learning, now that over 6 million California school kids will be, going, will be learning online this fall. That's why with everyone from Governor Newsom to State Superintendent Tony Thurman to the State Legislature, every member of the task force is committed to closing the digital divide in California ASAP. We want a more fair, more resilient, and more inclusive economy in the 21st century, starting with ensuring that everyone has access to the tools that they need to succeed. And in particular, we know that under no circumstance can we, the adults, fail our children. We cannot take no for an answer. Specifically on the task force, we've been working with members that represent Apple, Google, LinkedIn, Esri, AT&T, NBC, Universal, Comcast, Salesforce, Edison International, the Community Foundations, the California Teachers Association, and others. And they've been working diligently to bring forward specific ideas to address all aspects of the digital divide. In addition, we've been working with the other relevant private sector companies who are not members of the task force to make sure that we work collaboratively to get a comprehensive solution. In particular, the task force commends and appreciates the work of the internet service providers in our state and their long-standing efforts to provide connectivity to all Californians. But now we seek and need an even stronger partnership with them. During this time of distance learning and COVID-19, the internet service providers should and must 
increase their outreach regarding their affordable plan offerings, help deploy near-term connectivity solutions, as well as ensure that financially insecure families remain connected. We're also looking at a number of ways to provide technical support, including leveraging the community-based programs that are already working to advance digital literacy in our communities, and finding community volunteers to provide real-time assistance to people trying to learn online. Lastly, I just want to reiterate how thankful we all are to serve a governor that listens to scientists, puts public health first, and is willing to put together a bipartisan economic task force. A governor who says, put your partisanship aside. Bring me your best ideas, and let's rebuild together. At a time of great division and emotion across our country, we are doing it together. That's how we're supposed to be in America, especially when times are tough. Thank you. I appreciate the sentiment, and, and moreover, Tom, thank you for all your outstanding work uh, leading this task force. We were able just a couple of days ago to, to lay out a lot of the things that you've already accomplished on that task force and a lot of the uh, things that we'll be working with the legislature over the next few weeks to deliver. Uh, but none is more foundational in the fate and future of the state of California to future-proof this state to address the issue of, of, of equity, to address uh, this divide, again, that transcends just our school system, uh, but persists all throughout our society, uh, then finally uh, dealing with this digital divide in the state of California. No reason the state of California shouldn't lead the nation in this space. Uh, that's your resolve. It's our collective uh, commitment. And we codified a lot of that based upon guidance and support that uh, the 100-member task force provided, based upon guidance and support that a lot of key legislative leaders have provided, based upon uh, the expertise we're able to source at the California Public Utilities Commission and elsewhere. We've put out today an executive order, quite literally codifying uh, a lot of those recommendations, a lot of those thoughts. We have specific goals uh, as it relates to not just access uh, to uh, the Internet, but quality access, and we're talking in terms of a goal of 100 megabytes of download speed, which should be a foundational uh, pursuit for all of us across this country. I and mean, that's close to fiber-like speeds, but that's where we need to be if we're going to be globally competitive uh, and provide the quality of education, uh, regardless of our backgrounds that people deserve. We put out new mapping expectation. That was Tom's reference to Esri and others. Uh, new data collection, more transparency, more accountability. We have some strategies on funding, working with the legislature, uh, and what to Superintendent Thurman referenced some of the legislative uh, pursuits that are currently underway, uh, and new expectation in terms of time uh, to delivery and deployment and adoption. We also have dusted off this old broadband council uh, that existed, uh, well, uh, in a world that no longer exists, or at least was conceived in a world that no longer exists, we're still in sort of the dial-up mode in some of our thinking. And so we're going we're gonna to be upgrading uh, their work and put together a new action plan uh, that has to be fundamentally reimagined moving forward. So just wanted folks to know there's progress in that space. It's in the thematic uh, that we're advancing here today as it relates to digital abide and distance learning for our kids. But it's, again, foundational for our economic future as well. Uh, speaking about our future, uh, no one more committed to the future uh, of this state than the uh, leader, uh, president uh, of our school system in the state of California, Linda Darling Hammond. Uh, many of you know her well in terms of her advocacy and support, particularly for people with special needs, uh, the work she did at Stanford University in her own right, uh, in NGO she leads uh, internationally, not just nationally, um, uh, uh, connected uh, to this cause and constantly uh, providing a leading edge thoughts and leading edge uh, advice. Uh, we are just so blessed she took this formal role here in the state of California. But in that role, um, Linda has been working with local districts on the application, not of why we need to do distance learning, not what we need to do in terms of putting those guardrails in place, but how to deliver it from a bottom-up 
not just top-down perspective. She wants to talk a little bit more about that work. And uh, Linda, if you could just amplify the legitimate concerns we have as someone uh, with my own learning disabilities, uh, recognizing uh, the challenges with two of my kids in that place, and the really the needs to help special needs students in the state of California. I'd love you as well, just talk a little bit about that after you move forward with your broader presentation on the work you're doing at the local level. I'm glad to do that and thanks, uh, Governor, for all that you're doing to move this state forward in all the ways we've been talking about. I want to give us a small glimpse of what's happening in the field. How are our school systems stepping up in respect to all of the uh, initiatives we've just described? I uh, checked in with school leaders in a number of large and small districts this week. And as the state superintendent said, um, educators in California really are leaning in uh, both on uh, the quality of distance learning and the equity concerns that we have put front and center. Uh, and we've come a long way since spring in figuring out how to do this work. Uh, when schools were physically closed in March, school districts scrambled to figure out how to purchase devices. Uh, there were supply chain problems, how to get 20% of households without Wi-Fi wired up, how to help teachers learn how to effectively teach online. Uh, since then, a lot has happened. Our 58 county offices of education have stepped up in a big way to help districts with technology and training. Four of these counties, Kern, Orange, San Bernardino, and San Diego, have launched a distance learning consortium through the CCEE, which provides curriculum units and lesson plans, as well as training for teachers. Many have created their own digital equity task forces to purchase and distribute computers. The California Department of Education and the California Collaborative for Educational Excellence have been providing guidance, toolkits, webinars, and professional learning opportunities, as we heard. Districts have spent the summer gearing up to ensure quality and equity in distance learning. Uh, in talking to school leaders this week, in districts ranging from our biggest districts in Los Angeles, San Diego, and Long Beach, to tiny, high-poverty rural districts like Elk Hills, which is 30 miles east of Bakersfield, and San Lucas, which is in a part of Monterey County that has no street lights or sidewalks. Uh, I've heard how all of those districts have ensured that 100% of their students uh, can have laptops and hotspots in settings ranging from households to homeless shelters. A huge amount of learning has really gone on. San Diego and Elk Hills held focus groups with parents to learn about what worked and what did not work last spring, what families need, that guided their plans for common online platforms and instructional approaches in the fall. Los Angeles learned more about how to offer effective online instruction by offering summer school to all, and more than 100,000 students showed up, studying reading and math, of course, but also uh, music and the arts, uh, thousands of them took guitar lessons with instruments donated by Fender Guitars. They've got another 2,000 coming this year because they're committed to having the arts side by side with math and social studies and science and English language arts in their uh, curriculum. I heard from all of these districts how schools are organized to ensure that students will have daily face-to-face -face instruction covering the core instructional areas uh, plus PE and the arts in large and small groups and in one-to-one -one settings where those are needed to meet special needs. Uh, and every one of these districts had really thought through how to get uh, services, wraparound services um, to students with special education needs, even online, but they're interested as soon as it's made um, viable to bring small groups back face-to-face. Uh, the staff have learned how to use platforms and Zoom breakout rooms and chat boxes and how to work more effectively with parents and students in these virtual settings. In San Diego, parents and students, along with teachers, will have professional development at the start of the school year, August 31st for them. Uh, they'll all learn how to engage daily in the online learning and the project work that is going to occur in each of the subjects, as well as how to access teachers during their office hours for one-to-one -one problem solving. In Los Angeles, school starts next week. In addition to the daily classes and all their content areas, students who are in need will be able to access free online tutoring uh, to anyone who needs it. 
In Long Beach, starting September 1st, the district has more than enough laptops and hotspots for every child. The courses are planned and ready. And as was true last spring, they've identified excellent teachers who do a terrific job of distance learning who are offering classes and specialty subjects online. As many students as want to can come. Last spring, some of them drew over 2,000 students, and some will be offering demonstration lessons online for other teachers who want to learn their approaches. In Elk Hill, school started this week. 100% of students were connected and in attendance by day two of classes. This district has um, overhauled all of its curriculum plans in the subject areas to use technology to accelerate learning. Uh, they've got social emotional learning leading off every day, and that's also common across these districts. And finally, in very rural San Lucas, every student has been provided with a new laptop and internet service, but as uh, you and Tom Steyer and others were describing, Wi-Fi is still sometimes unreliable. So the district has prepared a plan B and a plan C. If the Wi-Fi fails, the students can call in to join the class and talk to the teacher. Students also have paper packups for backup if they can't get through um, online. Every week the staff will convene to figure out how to reach any children who are not able to engage that week, including making socially distanced house calls. They've got a mobile science lab that will provide free brown bag science projects. Every week they'll offer reasons to come to school, ranging from Music Mondays with dance videos to Travel Tuesdays with virtual field trips and Wacky Wednesdays with silly dress options and crazy hair days for online meetings with prizes from local organizations. So everyone is leaning in. The creativity that uh, our educators are showing in addressing this moment and in keeping equity front and center in this work is encouraging. We'll certainly encounter more challenges, but California is learning how to do this work. And at the end of the process, if we continue to double down, uh, when we go back to school in person, we're likely to have an uh, entire school system, students and staff that are more technologically proficient, stronger connections between home and school because people have had to figure out how to do that, and more capacity to support learning progress than we had before. I'm glad to answer additional questions, particularly on the issue of meeting the needs of our English learners and special education students. Um, I can say that in every uh, case where I talked to uh, school leaders, uh, this was front of mind for them and uh, very creative approaches to trying to figure out how to use small Zoom breakout rooms for paraprofessionals to work with the students with special needs, one-on-one -on -one, uh, meetings with specialists as well as with classroom teachers um, and uh, eagerness to get back to school in person. And Linda, perhaps just uh, if I may, just because I think it's important, the guidelines we put out recently afford the ability for districts to make a determination for those with acute needs uh, to allow in-person instruction, even uh, with the broader guidelines we put out. Maybe you can uh, just amplify that. I know there's additional uh, work being done in that space, but as a foundational principle, that is one that we have advanced uh, through your leadership, Tony Thurman's leadership. Yeah, and we, um, many, many districts are prepared to offer small, um, small group settings, even while schools are closed in the way that childcare uh, settings are allowed to operate with all of the rules that, you know, you reviewed for us earlier, um, to be able to bring back in person uh, those students whose needs um, are difficult to meet online and are much better met in person. We are working through guidance with the uh, California Department of Public Health that should be released this coming week that will um, allow school districts in collaboration and consultation with their local public health department um, to um, convene these small groups of students uh, in safe ways uh, that allow their needs to be met in person. I appreciate that. More on that uh, subject, but uh, I appreciate you just setting forth uh, the broader uh, tenure of expectation in terms of uh, our recognition that there are simply kids that will never, ever have 
that quality learning that we all desire to advance uh, online, no matter what kind of support we provide, even if we individualize it. And so we'll require even more. And so thank you for all of your work in that space, and, and including just your incredible advocacy. It's a space I don't want to get off topic, but over the last year and a half, uh, the budgets uh, that we have preserved, even in this economy, and the budgets we substantially enhanced last year, were in the special education space. And we recognize we have enormous amount of work still left to do. Again, as I said, closing things out, bottom line, learning is non-negotiable, but neither is safety. With that, let me briefly go through uh, the issue uh, that brings many of you to these press conferences and quickly update you on the latest number of case case positive cases that we have brought in since August 13th. Uh, you'll see a number there of 7,934, uh, as was the case on Wednesday. Before you jot that number down, uh, consider uh, that this will be the last day uh, we will have to report uh, backlogged cases related to a backlog uh, that many of you are very familiar with. Of the 7,934, 4,429 are backlog cases, putting our new case number today at 3,505. So this was uh, the day we committed to reporting out our efforts to clean up that backlog, bring all the positive cases related to the backlog of total cases, roughly 295,000 cases. Uh, a lot of those will be deduplicated, uh, and roughly uh, 20,000 positives in that cohort. On Monday, we're going to break down by county a detailed list so people will have with clarity and precision uh, every single number, again, on the county by county basis. But this completes our efforts, 100% uh, uh, of our efforts to address the backlog, to update our case numbers. And that's exactly what we're doing here on this slide and on this slide. Our positivity rate now in the state of California averaging 137,000 tests a day. And I'll repeat that. We're averaging 137,000 tests a day, 188,000 a few days back, 111,000 that came in yesterday. Averaging 137,000 uh, cases, we have a positivity rate, percentage of people that test positive for COVID-19 versus the total number of people that were tested of 6.2% uh, over uh, the last a 14-day period. Last time I presented the positivity rate, it was at 7.0% today uh, at 6.2%, moving as we uh, asserted a few weeks back and certainly asserted last week in a positive direction. You could see here, and you unpack this, the 14-day look at the positivity rate, uh, see where it was even pre uh, the last presentation at 7.0, uh, over 7.3, dropping down, stabilizing, bouncing around a little bit in the last seven or so days. Not surprisingly, and in accordance with trends that we have presented consistently over the course of months, positivity rates, uh, hospitalizations, ICUs, uh, being uh, having a relational uh, construct here, hospitalization numbers continue to decline, decline. 14 day number, 19.9% decrease, 20% decrease over a 14 day period. Uh, that's an encouraging sign. I remind you, as I always do, this is the total number in the aggregate. None of us live in the aggregate. Each and every one of you lives somewhere uh, to the extent you're watching this within the state of California, somewhere in the state, hospitalization numbers may vary, may be very different in terms of outlook and concerns for you. That's why we have a county monitoring list uh, reminding you the state's population is larger than 21 state populations combined. But in the aggregate, the state of California has experienced a roughly 20 percent decrease in hospitalization patients that have identified COVID-19 in the last 14 days. Uh, the last slide presentation um, last Monday, you saw numbers as high as 9 percent total uh, capacity in the hospital system, uh, bed capacity filled with COVID-19 patients. We're now uh, at 7 percent. ICU admissions down uh, some 14.3 percent, uh, roughly 14 percent, uh, basically tracking where hospitalizations are. Uh, that's an encouraging sign. Uh, we need to see more stability. We need to see that line continue to bend in this direction. We're not out of the woods. Do not take that snapshot, by the way, of 33 or so hundred positive cases uh, to assume anything. 
the trend over a 14-day period shows a much higher number than that, but we are seeing a trend nonetheless that is moving in the right direction because of all of your outstanding work. Thank you to everybody watching. Thank you to 40 million Californians um, and those that have really done their best to be responsible not only to their own health, but to their friends, family, loved ones in the broader community and the society. We're trying to rebuild after this pandemic. Care capacity in the ICUs down to about 20 percent uh, from 22 23. Um, and so you see that reflected in the pie chart. Uh, again, uh, encouraging numbers, putting a little less pressure on the system, but again, that pressure persists in certain parts, certain regions of the state disproportionately now, as we've been very clear about in the Central Valley. Uh, eight counties that uh, continue in that valley to be top of mind of concern and consideration. But even in the Central Valley, uh, we're seeing uh, in most cases, not every case, most case, a rate of growth that's beginning to decline, but still growth that is of concern. As the superintendent said, I don't have to always say it, please wear a mask, continue to physically distance. These are rules and guidelines that we put out within our education system when not if we reopen for in-person learning. That will happen, if you ask when that will happen, sooner than later if we continue to wear a mask and continue to take seriously the need to physically distance, including this weekend, where we now have a new flex order that just came out from the Cal ISO, uh, independent system operator. Uh, that basically means those are the experts as it relates to energy consumption in the state. Uh, they wanted me to tell you uh, that this flex warning that they put out today uh, means it would be uh, helpful to the entire electrical delivery system in the state of California if you can, to the extent warranted and possible, reduce your electricity consumption between the hours of 3 and 8 p.m. We're seeing tri triple digit uh, temperatures. I think I read they're anticipating Death Valley temperatures to go to a record of 127 degrees. That's in our state. That's not some distant land overseas. Uh, the next seven, eight, nine, ten days, uh, we're going to experience uh, record breaking temperatures as the case in any jurisdiction on the globe. That means we can all do well just to be thoughtful about our electricity and energy consumption. So um, if you wanted to remind your kids when you walk out of a room to turn the lights off, this is the time to do it, particularly between the hours of 3 and 8. When you're out there this weekend because of those triple digit temperatures, we encourage you to uh, physically distance, avoid as much mixing as you possibly can, maintain your vigilance as it relates to your own personal hygiene, uh, and washing your hands being uh, the most impactful thing you can do. So that's uh, a very long-winded presentation, forgive me, but I don't know anything more important to parents out there in the state of California than the subject matter uh, that uh, brings us uh, to this hour. And I also want to just again thank uh, the uh, head of our State Board of Education, uh, Linda Darling Hammond, and thank the Superintendent of Public Education, Tony Thurman. Thank you to the co-chair uh, of our Economic Recovery Task Force, Tom Steyer, for their participation, their presentations here today, and all of them stand by with me if, to answer any questions. Hannah Wiley, SAC B. Hi, Governor. Thanks for taking questions. Pivoting a little bit here, um, the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals today struck down the 2016 law uh, banning possession of high-capacity firearm magazines. So my question is, um, do you plan to take action? Will California respond to this? Um, and what's the next step moving forward on California's part? Well, I'm very proud of, of working uh, to lead that effort, also working with legislative leaders, Governor Brown, others that were instrumental in advancing that collective cause, California's leadership as it relates to gun safety, second to none in this nation. I'll remind everybody, a gun, respectfully, has never killed anybody unless the gun is used as a blunt instrument. A gun requires a dangerous and deadly component, and that is a bullet. 
ammunition. It's a rather interesting fact uh, in this state for over a quarter century. Not in this country, however. Uh, we uh, have background checks, comprehensive background checks, at least here in the state of California, uh, on gun purchases, but not uh, on its deadly component. And so we've long uh, advanced efforts to focus not just on guns, but also focus uh, on keeping uh, those dangerous components out of the hands uh, of people that otherwise uh, should not be afforded that fundamental privilege slash right. Uh, large capacity magazine clips, with respect, I think, fall into that category. There's been local ordinances uh, that have been upheld by the courts. Uh, this state ordinance. I haven't had the chance to read the decision. It just came out. When I do, uh, I'll have a chance to respond in detail to your question about what our next steps are. But I think it was sound. I think it was right. And I think uh, that the overwhelming, I don't think, I know the overwhelming majority of Californians agreed uh, when they supported a ballot initiative that we put forth asking them for their opinion on this subject as well. Patrick Healy, NBC4. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Governor, a uh, couple questions, one related to COVID and one related to the problems with the uh, United Parcel Service, uh, you, I'm sorry, USPS Postal Service, doubts whether or not it will be able to deliver the volume of mail-in ballots for the November election. Is there anything that the state of California can do to deal with that? And the COVID question in schools is related to what uh, Linda Darling-Hammond was talking about these small groups of students with special needs being able to convene in person. Can that occur in the state, in the counties on the watch list? And when will the specific guidance for that be coming out? No, thank you. Thank you for the question. And, and since I opened up that door and uh, opened up uh, the conversation in anticipation, uh, rightfully, that someone may bring it up, it's certainly one we've been talking about for months now. Uh, Linda, you're still on the phone. And if you could answer that question, and maybe you can also amplify it, talking a little bit about just a broad strokes preview of some of these care center uh, concepts uh, that are also being uh, formalized throughout the state. Right. So um, even as we speak, uh, child care centers do operate for essential workers and so on in various parts of the state, including the counties on the watch list. Um, those guidelines that have been created uh, can be um, developed further for a uh, similar kind of convening in school districts that are on the watch list, uh, counties that are on the watch list, um, to convene very small groups that are um, in small cohorts that do not interact with other cohorts that are uh, able to work with uh, staff, you know, on particular kinds of learning. Uh, that would be in counties that are on the watch list that you know, have uh, where, where the framework for the provision of those services you know, meets a whole set of guidelines. Um, similarly, uh, there are places in the state that are figuring out how to offer uh, settings for children to come to for distance learning if they're uh, in a place that cannot receive uh, internet or where there's not a parent at home or if they need uh, additional support in San Francisco, the children uh, the Department of Children, Families, and Youth is creating some of these kinds of um, essentially child care-like settings, small small groups with social distancing, uh, face coverings, uh, and support of adults to be sure that um, kids are supported uh, even during distance learning. Uh, so that, as I said, was, is um, something that's being worked through in terms of the guidelines and will be uh, available probably within the week for um, consideration by school districts. Appreciate it. Uh, the question is uh, a very sensitive one and very poignant and personal one for hundreds of thousands of families in this state. And so uh, I appreciate, Alinda, you're illuminating a little bit more about what's already happening in this space, but moreover, uh, some of the more specific prescriptive guidelines we'll be putting out. Again, a lot of pressure, a lot of anxiety on parents, on students, these kids, our kids themselves, uh, and uh, our teachers and paraprofessionals and others. And I just want to say to all the teachers and paraprofessionals, uh, thank you. 
Thank you for working through your own anxieties, your own fears, your own concern about your own personal health. Many of you have kids yourself that uh, need uh, support uh, in addition to the kids that you are uh, supporting every day in uh, our virtual classrooms. I know all of you got into education for equity purposes, overwhelming majority of did, to right wrongs, to address the issue of social mobility, uh, and care deeply uh, about learning disabilities and learning differences and the needs, the special needs that so many of your students have. So uh, again, a uh, lot of work being done, a lot of anxiety in this space, and uh, know that uh, uh, we've got a good team, Linda and her team, and of course, uh, great work of our superintendent that uh, are resolved uh, for the long haul to address these issues. Let me just quickly address the issue as it relates to uh, what's happening or not happening with some of the sabotage that's clearly intentionally being done uh, to our postal delivery here in this country. Uh, this is going to impact not just elections, it's going to impact your ability to get uh, quality care in terms of your prescriptions, to uh, get information, to be able to correspond with loved ones and the like. Vulnerable populations disproportionately being impacted because of their utilization uh, of our postal system. Uh, I haven't experienced this in my lifetime. I don't know that any of us have um, the weaponization of sorts uh, of uh, our postal system. Uh, here's an answer to your question. Uh, I am not uh, a member of the federal uh, government, uh, but however, as a federal taxpayer, I demand and expect more uh, of our country, uh, and that first needs to be called out. Uh, I'm not alone in calling that out, and I don't know that this, by any stretch, is even a partisan issue. Uh, I think vast majority of us, regardless of our political stripes, uh, would assess the situation accordingly and assert, uh, I think, similar sentiment around legitimate concern uh, about uh, sorting systems uh, vanishing, around concerns around just basic, fundamental, life-saving delivery uh, that has been part of our proud history. It relates to our postal service. It's about it's Americana, it's apple pie, and I'll throw in baseball. That being said, uh, it relates to the issue of what the state can do. Let me tell you what we've done. Uh, I signed two executive orders a number of months ago to jumpstart the process working with our Secretary of State, Alex Padilla, uh, on mail-in ballots. Mail-in ballots are well known and well utilized here in the state of California, increasing numbers every election of people using absentee ballots, which are mail-in ballots, very effectively and very safely. The numbers increase every single year, but not everybody wants the benefit of a mail-in ballot, even in a pre-COVID environment. They want the in-person experience. There's something uh, that uh, is very touching and emotional about that. I'll be honest, that's my uh, preferred source of voting. There's something about uh, election day, bringing your kids, as I have last few times, and, and sort of teach them civics. Uh, it's deeply emotional and, and it attaches very deeply uh, and sear uh, very deeply in my memory uh, from the first time I was able to vote. We want to provide those points of access as well. And that was a second executive order uh, I signed to provide uh, access points for drop off that is not just to the Postal Service, drop-offs of ballots that you may have filled out at home but want to drop off in person, provisional ballots and the like, and the work that obviously uh, needs to be done for people uh, that uh, otherwise are not accessing or cannot, for other limitations and challenges, uh, the uh, absentee or mail-in ballots. Uh, those two executive orders were codified. Thank you to the leadership of the California legislature. They, they passed two pieces of legislation, and I recently just signed them uh, to double down on those commitments, but we also did this. We have a provision that allows 17 days to collect ballots. If it's postmarked, we will give uh, the ability for our registrars to get those things collected and, moreover, uh, certified but over a 17-day period. We thought that was important with all the uncertainty of COVID. We didn't realize how prescient, not just important, that now appears to have been with what has happened with some of um, what I would describe almost as vandalism uh, of, our, uh, of our postal system. And so I hope, I hope this is a temporary moment. Uh, I hope cooler heads will prevail. I hope Congress will work with the President to address his concerns and uh, work together to build this into the next stimulus package, put aside our differences. Uh, I expect and believe that will happen. Uh, 
not, I say not just as an optimist, but I, I think as a pragmatist as well. It's in everyone's interest that this get resolved, but in California's interest, we have a 17-day window uh, if indeed there are delays. Hey, Governor Newsom, uh, thanks, as always, for giving us some time. Um, we've asked you about this before, but there are now two wealth tax proposals for the legislature, uh, pushed in particular by teacher unions who say they're going to need that money to be able to reopen safely. They've made clear that this is going to be one for next year, um, so I think we can count on that being at the top of the agenda for them. Is that a proposal that you would be potentially willing to entertain the idea of some sort of wealth tax to help fund schools? Yeah, I haven't looked at it. Now, we have an initiative on the ballot to do just that. So, look, I want to see where things, uh, where things go over the next few months. We passed a 54, well, we passed a budget that closed a $54.3 billion shortfall. Uh, we did it on the basis of a lot of support from the federal government. We did it with some expectation of additional support, including to our public education system. Uh, we anticipate gaps in our budget next year in roughly $8.7 to $9 billion. So we project sir, uh, a shortfall into the future. And so we'll be working very, we have been working uh, very uh, diligently to address that shortfall. I have a presentation uh, that I'm already working on uh, to the legislature, a January budget proposal. Uh, so as far as I'm concerned, you have to be considerate and open uh, to what uh, the conditions uh, provide for. And so we'll anticipate uh, things passing on the ballot, perhaps things falling short. What happens if this passes? What happens if this doesn't pass? What is the next step? What's the next consideration? I haven't read this. I saw a press release or Moreover, I thought some reporting on a wealth tax. I will just say this, though. We're the state of California, not the United States of America. I thought the tax cut that uh, President Trump advanced was a huge mistake, a colossal mistake that will impact our kids and grandkids. You saw that demonstrably so in one of the most robust economic expansion periods in American history, one uh, the president clearly inherited from the previous administration, that we were running historic deficits. That was only possible because, uh, well, it was aided, certainly, uh, by uh, that historic tax cut where many companies and individuals weren't even asking for it. I thought that was a mistake, and I'm looking forward to the Biden administration to right that wrong and fix that. I think at a state level, it's a way of long-windedly making this point, you have to be careful about taking to national constructs, uh, which may be appropriate for a nation, uh, and having state-by-state -state constructs uh, until and unless you consider the impacts of those decisions on your ability to retain and attract uh, talent, individuals, companies, uh, and your competitiveness. Everything needs to be considered in that light. And I would encourage uh, those that are making proposals in this space to consider those impacts in relationship uh, to what may or may not be happening in other parts of this nation. So for me, the issue of taxation uh, issue is, for me, one where, as a federal construct, it means one thing. Uh, as a state and even at a local level, one has to consider the impacts of these decisions in terms of our competitive environment, in terms of all of those factors uh, as well. Corin Hoggard, ABC 30. Good afternoon, Governor. We have a fairly sizable private religious school here in Fresno County that open for in-person instruction yesterday, then got a public health officer order to close, and yet they opened again today despite that order. So can you talk to us about the consequences for that, both from the public health perspective and also the legal perspective? Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I, I, I grew up, I had the privilege of at least a moment of, uh, of education at Catholic schools. We were taught to respect rules and regulations. And, uh, and so I'm, I'm disappointed, obviously, that they're not abiding by their local health officer, whose purpose it is simply to keep people healthy, keep people safe, not only the kids, but uh, the leadership uh, of that school and others. So I, by definition, I'm disappointed in that, uh, particularly as someone who grew up in the church uh, and, and has profound reverence profound reverence, not just respect for its teachings. Um, and maybe uh, this, for me, not maybe, this provides a bit of a disconnect uh, in that respect, uh, because I think uh, we operate uh, from a communitarian perspective, at least in terms of uh, the religious teachings that I was afforded. And I think as it relates to this pandemic um, and uh, how easily transmitted uh, this disease is, 
uh, and how impacted this state and our economy and our nation and the world has been uh, that we'd all do well to abide by our local health officers. And so the system we set up was designed uh, exactly as it's now operating. The local health officer doing the right thing uh, to the extent that this school unfortunately is choosing not to model uh, good behavior in doing the right thing. And to the extent uh, that the county will be involved and to the extent the state needs to be involved, we'll consider that. Uh, so look, I, I'm not, you know, what happens in these instances, the governor sort of points something out and people, you know, react and everybody flexes their muscles. I, I'm not trying to flex any muscle here. Uh, all I am is trying to encourage people to stay safe, stay healthy, because my absolute goal is one I think the leaders of the school share, and that's to keep our kids safe, to keep them educated. Uh, our default remains in-person education for all of the reasons uh, that we've stated and all the reasons I know that the leadership of that school believes in. But we can do that by moving quickly uh, to eradicate and mitigate the spread of this disease get the treatments and ultimately get to a vaccine. The sooner we do that, as soon as we model good behavior uh, and don't send mixed messages, then the sooner all of us go back to school and we all achieve our respected goals. And so that's my hope and expectation. And I say that with deep love and deep reverence uh, for the teachings of that school. Final question, Margaret Carrero, KNX. Yes, Governor, thank you so much for taking questions. I'm um, hoping you could speak to a little bit about um, California becoming the first state with 600,000 confirmed cases of COVID and uh, speak a little bit more to the specifics of today's executive order, if you could. Yeah, I think the 6.2% positivity rate is a very encouraging sign. I think it's interesting, California, um, while we may have gotten a slower start than we otherwise wanted, it's a stubborn start as it relates to testing. Um, you know, we've been able to step up our testing uh, in a meaningful way. It's still not where I believe we should be and where I'm committed to taking the state in terms of total number of tests. But we are punching above our weight now in terms of our efforts to, to really get a sense of what is the background rate of infections? What's the community spread of this disease? We're not shying away from that. We're not playing in the political frame uh, that somehow tests are bad because they were by definition uh, show a higher uh, count of total number of positives. But the number that really matters to us, the one that I'm not as fixated on as perhaps others are, uh, is that positivity rate that gives us a better sense of what's really happening in terms of the community spread. What's happening in our hospitals is foundational. What's happening in the ICUs is foundational. Obviously, that leads to concerns and uh, obvious issues related to morbidity mortality. And so that's where um, our energies are. Uh, but I, I'm not going to back off on more tests because I fear a question like yours or concern uh, about total number of cases. You have a responsibility. This nation, uh, I think, deserves uh, to have a better sense to know um, how prevalent is this disease. And I can assure you it's a exponentially, well, maybe not exponentially, it's significantly, I would argue, more prevalent than those numbers even in California suggest. And it's simply because uh, we haven't put the testing uh, protocols in place and we haven't scaled our testing capacity as the most innovative nation on the planet. And so that includes California. We've got work to do. We've got this X Prize we put out. We've got this new testing task force that's been instructed to be more creative in terms of new testing strategies, new in-home testing strategies, non-PCR uh, testing strategies. Uh, and we'll be looking forward to announcements in that space, or I hope you'll look forward to them uh, very, very soon. So that's just uh, that's it broadly on a nutshell. You'll see the executive order. Forgive me, I don't want to belabor this, but uh, we have that executive order. It should be up online and available to you. Uh, it's multiple pages. You'll see the details in the executive order in terms of this broadband council and some of our new goals and expectations on 100 megabits and uh, bytes, rather, and other strategies to improve uh, and expand our uh, efforts that uh, Tom and his team have been working on for many, many months. So that's a, that's a, that's a long day um, for all of you that have been tuning in. Thank you for the privilege of your time and attention. I want to thank my team, Ben Chita in particular, for all his hard work in terms of the education guidance and 
Uh, Dr. Pan is with us today and her outstanding work working with the counties. They'll be working overtime this weekend uh, to clarify any final details. So we really wanted to get that presentation to a point where everybody's 100% uh, uh, on the same page and that will happen Monday. We'll get that new updated monitoring list out and about, uh, work with those elementary schools that are looking to do these waivers. Many of them uh, have already submitted waivers uh, and we look forward to the Epi Daddy data uh, coming out Monday to help advance that cause as well. With that, continue the cause of good hygiene, wearing a face mask, be safe, and try to avoid mixing uh, this very hot weekend. And between three and eight, if you could, I so would be pleased, um, maybe turn off a few lights uh, if you could to help us with our energy grid. Take care, everybody.